This is actually a combination of two core facilities that have been in the IU Simon Cancer Center for a while. And so we'll talk a little bit about our new organization. And you'll get to meet um, Paul Torito today. He is the scientific director for our IVA Spectrum CT Technology Group. Um, Tony Sen, who manages the in vivo therapeutics component of the core, and also Emily Sims, who manages our cellular response technologies. So just a little bit, um, as I mentioned, this is a combination of two core facilities that have been um, overseen by the IU Simon Cancer Center for a while. One was the NGO Bio Core, the other was the in vivo therapeutics core, and this is now um, our new name. And these are the staff, um, wonderful staff that we engage with um, to pull all the um, different services and things that we are involved in. Um, additionally, um, Emily's group also supports um, the Translational Research Corps um, under um, Kristen Rush. So as you can see, we really try to um, share personnel, share expertise, um, and that way we can get more done. Um, so what we're gonna do first is, um, Tony is going to give just an overview of our structure and we'll go from there, thanks. Thanks, Karen. Um, so as Karen mentioned, I have managed the in vivo therapeutics core, the IVT core, since inception in 2007 within the IU Simon Cancer Center. Uh, we have three main avenues of services that we provide. One is the mouse breeding colonies that are on site, um, three different colonies of immune deficient animals that are great for a lot of the cancer um, studies that folks are looking to do, and a lot of patient-derived xenograft mo models can be uh, utilize those animals, and then also three colonies of conventional animals that are great for stem cell transplants, uh, PK, PD, tox type studies. Uh, so our animals are utilized by many investigators on this campus and also the other CTSI affiliate campuses. We do ship animals to the other facilities as well if they don't have colonies of say the uh, NSG or NSGS mice in house, we're able to ship them to Bloomington, for example. Um, one, the other avenue that we oversee and operate the Mark I irradiator for all investigators on campus. So that is utilized to uh, precondition the animals prior to a stem cell transplant and also for uh, tissue culture samples that can be irradiated for in vitro experiments. That's coordinated with our staff and scheduled. Uh, we're the only ones for security reasons that have access to the instrument. So it's planned ahead and scheduled online and coordinated with our staff. Uh, as I mentioned, the patient drive xenograft program that we're involved in, currently I think we have over 30 different PDX lines uh, under various uh, cancer indications for multiple PIs that we oversee the implant uh, measure and passage of those tumors and coordinating future efficacy studies that will be uh, done utilizing those animals and those tumor samples. So we can assist investigators with bringing new models into the core and managing those for them or with them. A big part of what we do is a, a training and education aspect as well. So if a student or postdoc wants to be involved in the uh, hands-on animal research, we're open to assisting and training and educating those folks as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, the PKPD, basically anything in vivo related, mouse studies and rat studies primarily, uh, our staff has experience with other animal models as well, but right now it's primarily mouse and rat studies. Uh, we utilize STR authenticated mycoplasma negative cell lines. We have a bank of many different cell lines that are available for distribution to investigators, uh, assisting with new model development, uh, like I said, dosing and monitoring, tumor studies, uh, basic talks for new compounds that have never been dosed in an animal. We can uh, downstream analysis that we will help coordinate 
we will distribute samples back to the investigator or help them coordinate with the various other cores on campus, uh, medical genomics, a CPAC core for mass spec analysis, flow cytometry, the imaging core, pathology core, proteomics core, just a few of the ones that we interface with. Uh, as Karen mentioned, you'll hear more from Paul and Emily about the IVA spectrum CT there at the bottom of the screen, some of the data that has uh, come out of that instrument that we recently uh, took over the operation and oversight for. And then Emily, the bar on the left, Emily will talk more about some of the technologies within the CRT. This slide will show some of the cost effectiveness of the on-site breeding colonies that we manage and oversee. Um, again, the immune compromised mice, when you buy them from Jackson Labs are over $100, almost $150 per mouse. We're able to purchase at that price and then breed in-house uh, <clears throat> cost savings on those strains are over 70% per mouse, uh, selling them for 30 to, 30 to $40 per mouse. That's prior to any discounts that are available to investigators that are members of various grants or centers on campus. Uh, and then the conventional animals that are primarily used for stem cell transplants, uh, significant cost savings on the boy J. The F1 mice are not available commercially anywhere. The C57 are pretty much the same cost from Jackson Labs, but there are a lot of investigators like the fact that ours are bred in-house. There's no uh, transportation across, halfway across the country from Jackson Labs. And then again, there's subsidies that are involved for members that uh, can bring that cost down even further from that. And then just at the bottom one, metric that we always like to track, the cost savings as compared to buying the animals that we generated and utilized last year, cost savings of over $700,000 in animals alone, just for animal procurement costs. So that will allow your research dollars to go that much further to uh, have more replicates or increase number of animals per group or just use the funding somewhere else. Thanks, Tony. Oh. So what we want to do now real quick is just talk a little bit about the mouse strains, um, the immunodeficient mouse strains that we have that can be used for humanizing mice. We're gonna spend most of our talk today um, really focused on some of the technology that um, Emily oversees in the CRT in Nepal with the IVA spectrum. But just as a brief overview, we used to breed nod skid mice. We actually don't breed those anymore, but these mice are what some of the other strains are built upon. Um, compared to nudes, these have more of a defective and absent adaptive and innate immune system. Um, they are fairly sensitive to DNA damaging agents like chemotherapy and irradiation. And this has to do with um, a gene that is mutated um, in these animals called, called PRKDC, which stands for a protein kinase DNA activated catalytic polypeptide. It's a mouthful. But I always like to bring this up for this background so people know that, that you know, this gene gene is going to be mutated in all the cells in, in the, um, the mouse body. And so you can see why something that is really kind of a, a critical player in DNA double strand break repair um, could make these mice sensitive. We haven't noticed any major sensitivities. Our friends at Purdue, though, have found that these mice um, are a little more sensitive to doxorubicin type treatments. So the mice that we currently breed, Nodskid, Gamma, and Null, are still used um, extensively here at IU. They are a great model um, for hematopoietic stem cell transplants and growing tumors. Um, these mice are more immunodeficient in that they have um, complete deletion of the um, common gamma chain that's actually found in a variety of cytokine receptors. And so these mice, in contrast to the original NS mice, there is no natural killer cell development in these mice, which really makes them a, um, a great host for growing human tissues. We also are breeding and are starting to scale up a bit now um, a mouse that's built upon the NSG called NSGS, and this is a triple transgenic animal. Um, that expresses um, human um, IL-3, GMCSF, and CKIT. And investigators in the field have found that these mice are indeed superior grafters um, of diverse hematopoietic lineages, as well as primary AML samples. Again, these mice still have that innate sensitivity to DNA damaging agents. 
Um, but it's, you know, I think you have to get to pretty high doses to see it. Where we've seen most of those effects is actually in irradiation experiments where you may have a flank tumor and you're radiating. And I think that any of those types of experiments would not work well in an NSG background. But here's our other mouse strain that would work well if radiation is part of your treatment. And this is a, a nod mouse, and it's actually congenic. It harbors a targeted knockout in the RAG1 gene. So again, this is going to interfere with things such as VDJ rearrangement and T-cell receptors and B-cell immunoglobulin receptors. And it all still, still has the gamma chain um, null um, in this animal. And so these animals still engraft well. Um, my lab has used it to grow tumors. Tumors grow great in these animals. And these are gonna be more resistant to DNA damaging agents such as chemotherapy um, and irradiation. And so we do a lot of different types of modeling as Tony mentioned, there are a lot of um, humanizing the bone marrow. Again, we do murine transplants. We support a lot of the um, hematopoiesis group um, with those types of studies. And then we also do um, really a fair amount of engraftment studies, whether it be flank or orthotopic modeling with cell lines and patient-derived um, xenograft models. And we're starting to get into actually combining some of these models where you really try to um, use younger animals um, and transplant them with cord blood CD34s and kind of reconstitute the human immune system to a little bit better degree so you can have some microenvironmental effects in these models where you have a human bone marrow, you have an immune system that is um, at least partly human, and then you can look how this can influence um, tumor growth or come into play with um, combination or immunotherapy approaches. So with that, we're gonna move over to really kind of the main part um, of our talk today. And Emily um, from CRT is gonna talk about our Incusite live cell analysis instruments. Thanks, Emily. Yep, thanks, Karen. Um, I've been in the CRT uh, since 2011 and the lab manager for the past seven or so years. Um, the CRT is fortunate enough to have two live cell analysis instruments. We have the S3 and the Zoom. They're both uh, the same machine, just the S3 is the updated uh, newer model of the Zoom, but they both um, perform the same tasks. Um, and the benefits of a live cell analysis instrument is they provide simple and flexible sample prep. You can set it up and walk away. Um, you can acquire images over days or weeks, kind of the most that people do might be 14 days. And then if you do want to have something in 14 days, we also provide, um, we have a hood that you could use to change your reagents, change your media, um, anything like that. You can view and analyze in real time or later. So your images are captured and you they will be there um, until you want to analyze it. It could be a month from now, or um, if you need to reanalyze something, um, the space on there, I think it's um, like 20 terabytes or, or eight terabytes, something. So we've not had to clean up any of the images. So uh, they will hold on there for a long time. And they both have support for multiple users. So they can accommodate up to six microplates at a time. The Main thing with the S that's different with the S3 than the Zoom is users can schedule experiments at different image acquisition frequencies and magnif magnifications. The Zoom has a 4x and 10x objective, where the S3 has those also, but also a 20x. So the S3, if someone wants to image at 4x for every two hours and someone wants to image at 10x every six hours, that's possible. Whereas on the Zoom, everyone would need to be at 10x for two hours. And we adjust the um, schedule accordingly. Uh, my coworker, Matt, and I handle all the scheduling. There's nothing on online, but we like a paper schedule. We're kind of old school in that sense. But um, it's very easy to, with having two machines, to balance the needs of all of the users. So just with the basic software that comes with both systems, you can look at uh, numerous um, different applications. And so you can look at cell health and proliferation, cell movement and morphology, um, assays for 3D models, cell function and cell monitoring and workflows. Uh, the the uh, 
software that are in blue, those are extra modules that we have on the system to look at angiogenesis, scratch wound migration invasion, cell by cell analysis, and spheroid growth. Um, the Zoom houses the angiogenesis and scratch wound modules, whereas the S3 has the cell by cell analysis and spheroids. So to utilize those modules, you will have to go on a specific instrument, but just for proliferation, cell cycle, apoptosis, everything that's in black, you can use on both machines. So it's really handy if one is busy um, and you're just doing a proliferation, you can hop on the other machine. And this is the basic Incusite workflow. This is of the S3. Um, the Zoom software is a little more antiquated if you compare, but you do you get the same image results from the Zoom and the S3. They both provide very, very high resolution imaging um, of your cells and they both uh, image in phase, red fluorescence and green fluorescence. So you have those three capabilities. And so with the S3, you just have the automatically, you know, acquire your images over time and you can use the vessel view to view all, you know, 96 wells, it does a 384 well, plate, um, it supports many, many different vessels. You can do, you know, six well, um, and then you go on to, and you create your analysis mask, and, you know, you can do your cell count or, you know, whatever you're um, looking at, and you can do time-lapse graphs. And I think one of the neatest things is the plate graph, and you can see how your cells behave over time in each individual well um, of your experiment. So I want to kind of focus a little bit now on the kind of what a lot of uses, what a lot of users use for um, the instruments and what the experiments they're doing. So um, just as an apoptosis assay in the caspase 3.7, so we know the activation of caspase 3 or 7 results in the irreversible commitment of the cell to apoptotic death and is considered a reliable marker for apoptosis. So what is great with the incusite is um, the dyes are inert non-fluorescent substrates that freely cross the membrane where they can be cleaved by the activated caspase to release either a green or red DNA binding fluorescent label. And then the apoptotic cells are identified by the appearance of fluorescently labeled nuclei. And I'll play this video again, but this is just a um, image of here's, you know, phase and green fluorescence and your green fluorescence only. Um, it's a little hard to see and just kind of your graphs you can generate. But if you see in this video, this is a time lapse of how your uh, cells are captured on the NQ site and how you can graph um, your time core. That's all if you, you just leave it in there and then we will help you set up the analysis program. And that's kind of the data output you can get from the CAS phase. Um, another big um, use is for angiogenesis. And um, of course, in our lab, we used to do heavy, heavy angiogenesis work and we've shifted kind of gears, but this was from a couple of years ago, we did a project with someone and you know your tube forming assay and typically you've done your tube forming assay and then at maybe three hours, you take your plate out and image, six hours you take it out and you, you, know, you have to take it in and out of your incubator. Whereas when it's in the machine, it's, it's, it's a set it and forget it. And you can capture these tube formations over time where you don't have to disrupt your plate and hope to not disrupt your matrix gel. And so, you know, this is just an example of, um, you know, HIV negative cells and kind of their tube formings. They're, they're very, um, you know, normal vascularization and then HIV positive patients not on treatment and their vascularization is poor. And then HIV patients that are on a treatment and it's a pretty normal vascularization. And this video down here is just a time-lapse video of, that you can see how the tubes form over time and they're nice junctions. And I think what's great with the angiogenesis software is before when we would do it, we would just kind of count the enclosures and that's kind of the metrics you got. But with this software, just with all of within this one image, you can capture cell area, average tube width uniformity, networks, network area, network length, average network length, average tube width and network branch points. You get all of those metrics from this one experiment and you set up your masks and all that stuff and it calculates it for you. But instead of, are you trying to on image J or, you know, um, was it prism, I think, you know, to measure all the tube lengths, it, it does it for you. So it's a really, 
a high output and high um, numbers that you can get from this um, software. Another one that's really, really highly used in the lab are the scratch wound assays. And so with the Incusite scratch wound assays, you can assess the effect of treatments on full-time course migration profiles, assess metastatic potential and define the effect of treatments on invasive phenotype and explore differential biology of cell migration and invasion in the same plate. And what's really great is we have this scratch wound tool and it's a 96, like 96 pins and you put it on your 96 well plate and it does a uniform scratch in all of the wells at the same, at one time. And so you, as you can see in this image, it's a very uniform across the well scratch. And like, I know sometimes that using the tip, you get um, just not very uniform scratches. So this tool is really, really helpful with that. And we have that in the, in the core for use. You're um, welcome to use it. And you do have to have a special plate, which we also have those plates too. Um, to then generate the data. So um, in this video that I'll play in a second, you can, the first one, you will um, you can see the differences in morphology and the rate of wound closure between migration and, in, and invasion cells all within the same assay. And then you can see that the rate of migration is greater than the rate of invasion. And then it'll flip to um, a 2D migration and 3D invasion. So it has the, ability with the two fluorescents that you can um, image a two fluorescent scratch wound in addition to phase contrast now that allows users to explore cell to cell interactions as it pertains to cell migration and invasion. So one cell that invades is red and one that doesn't is green and you'll see that interaction and that's all captured within this incusite system. So you'll just kind of see how it goes through and the wounds close and the cells invade. And you get the you know quantitative data output and your microplate graph. And then this is the mixed cultures that's really neat. You can see the red cells, how they are invasive, and then the green cells are non-invasive. And that's all captured in the fluorescence. And then you have your phase image also. And then the last one I'm going to talk about is the spheroids. I know we've had a since we've gotten the spheroid module, it's been used a lot because I know it's um, really popular and important um, research. But so conventional imaging systems are inherently difficult to adapt to kinetic analysis of in vitro culture modules due to things like missed information in between imaging intervals and multiple uncontrolled environmental fluctuations like taking your plate in and out and you're disrupting your spheroid formation. Um, and you know, with the incusite, your plate just stays in there. Um, like I said, you can take it out, change your media and put it back in and it'll keep imaging the same time, um, time points that you need. You kind of take it out in between your two hours and put it back in before the next scan. And so the 3D and single and multi-tumor spheroid assays offer an integrated kind of turnkey solution to automatically um, trace and quantify tumor spheroid formation, growth and health. So this will be the first video will show you the single spheroids and the second one will go into multi-spheroids and you can just see how those images are um, captured in the bright field, um, which that's specific to the spheroid analysis module is that it'll image in bright field. And it can capture if they're fluorescent and how they grow over time, that single spheroid and the multi-spheroid assays how they grow once, you know, the top one's the control and the second one is treated. You can compare those, you know, all within the same plate, you have your control group and your um, test group. So sartorius.com has uh, so much information. This is what the, um, the machines are from Sartorius. And if you just log on and you look up live cell imaging analysis, you get all of the information on all of the assays that they um, can do, and then specifically the modules. And if you have any other questions on how to schedule, like I said, you just email me with um, scheduling questions um, and we'll get you on. Kind of need about a week um, ahead just to kind of see how the schedule looks as so it can kind of fill up, but um, really easy to work with you um, and how you want to use the machine. And so Emily, you mm -hmm. also
Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we'll work with you on that because a lot of times what you plate normally for proliferation, the cell number, it's since it's computer and it's um, very specific, you might need less cells or more cells to um, do your confluence. But yeah, we'll work with you on that. And then investigators too um, can actually to get the software downloaded. I think they have to work with our IT person, yes. but yes. they can download it and then be able to look at yes. what's going on yeah. remotely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the other feature too is, um, particularly with this new team at Sartorius, you all have got a good working relationship mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. This is touchy software mm -hmm. technology. Um, so we do have some times where it goes down a little bit, yeah. but I think you guys have a really great relationship with the company, which is important. Yeah. So thanks, Emily. Yeah. Um, and so what we're going to finish up with for about the next 15, 20 minutes is the newer technology that really, actually the core came in uh, to help manage this with Dr. Torito right before COVID hit. <laughs> um, but there's a lot that happened during that time. The machine was moved to a room down in the LARC facility so it can be closer to the animals. So we've got a, you know, its own place for operation, which I think has been a bonus. And so Paul, thanks so much um, um, for giving us an overview today. All right, thank you, Karen. <clears throat> so as Karen mentioned, um, our team uh, has been working closely with, uh, with the uh, Viva Therapeutics Corps over the, the past several years. Um, uh, I, I've spent the past 10 years or 11 years at, at, um, at IU developing imaging-based biomarkers. Um, right, so I spent the past um, 11 years or so at, at IU. Um, prior to that, I, I worked at Lilly for, for 10 years developing imaging-based biomarkers. Um, and so, um, it's a natural fit for, for our team to, to um, be involved with the activities of the in vivo therapeutics core and helping to manage this instrument because it provides um, the opportunity for us to um, help investigators do model phenotyping and, and drug, um, drug assessment um, all in one setting. And so um, several years ago, uh, this instrument was brought into the IU Cancer Center. Um, and uh, this instrument is called IVA Spectrum CT. It's still considered the state-of-the-art instrument. Uh, it offers um, a pretty tremendous uh, set of, um, of technologies that array from everything from um, longitudinal imaging uh, non-invasively with animals, both with fluorescence and bioluminescence. And this allows uh, investigators to, to really um, focus on orthotopic models instead of uh, the type of models that were previously used years ago, um, where uh, investigators are using um, ectopic models, um, which um, alters the microenvironment of the tumor's growth. Um, it also gives us um, a keen opportunity to study mechanism clearly in model systems. Um, there are a number of mouse models that express CRE um, uh, that are tied to luciferase. And so these are floxed mice that they would be crossed with so that you can actually um, use the, the Cree model um, to actually specifically do a tissue selective expression of your uh, luciferase and then test specific questions about, um, about the uh, mechanism of your treatment or of your, um, of your particular pathway that you're interested in. Um, and so that's actually quite um, uh, a key feature of this system. And then importantly, um, you can use it for therapeutic development. And, and this is an area that um, we've worked on extensively with um, Karen's team, um, both in uh, glioblastoma models, but also in pancreatic cancer um, with several investigators in the cancer center. So um, this provides an opportunity to do large scale uh, therapeutic studies um, in model systems, which are well characterized and controlled, um, and then provide you um, data to help answer those questions. Um, the way this is, is conducted is uh, we um, perform studies either using bioluminescent imaging um, or fluorescent imaging. And in both cases, you can actually do fairly high throughput Im imaging with up to five mice at a time. Um, in both cases, either uh, bioluminescence or fluorescence, you can do quantitative tomography, which is a three-dimensional technology. It's a little slower throughput, but it does provide you the ability to actually see the object in three dimensions, um, which is quite handy if you're trying to understand the distribution of your tracer or of the biology that um, is uh, interacting um, with its microenvironment. 
Uh, the system also has the capability of doing, um, in the case of fluorescence, multiplexing um, and also spectrally unmixing some of that um, um, autofluorescence that occurs within the biological system. So most animals have autofluorescence. Um, and interestingly, um, the food that they eat actually has autofluorescence. And so um, this system has the ability to um, reduce that contamination in the signal by unmixing that, um, which is, is quite handy. And many of the systems that are on the market don't have this capability, but this system does. And it's a special uh, feature of this, of this instrumentation. And then um, importantly, it also has a micro CT um, and it uses the CT, this low dose, um, high, um, high throughput CT scanning to provide the, um, the surface structure um, that is used for the tomographic reconstruction for the bioluminescent and fluorescent imaging. And you can see in the panels down below here, from left to right, we have bioluminescence, fluorescence imaging on the second panel in, the third panel in is actually um, a spectral and mixing where they've mixed multiple fluorophores. And the fourth panel over is a tomographic reconstruction of, um, of fluorophores within the uh, head of an animal. And so this system has a lot of features and capabilities. Um, importantly, in almost all systems, um, it requires um, like this, it requires a reporter system um, to be used in conjunction with the instrumentation. Um, this system has uh, a tremendous um, range of capabilities, including uh, luciferase, which comes from either the firefly or uh, Gaussia um, mechanisms of um, chemiluminescent chem chem conversion of, um, of the molecules energy into a photon that you can then capture with the system. And that requires very sensitive um, optics uh, and camera uh, configurations that this system actually has. On the, so that's on the left side of the spectrum. And on the far right of the set, um, spectrum, we actually have fluorescent imaging that is used um, with a combination of molecules that have either been uh, tagged or are, um, are activatable and, um, and are also fluorescent at the same time. And so this provides you an opportunity to look at biological processes that are related to the properties of that molecule and its, um, and its expression. Importantly, we also in the middle there have the opportunity um, if you happen to have a fluorescent protein system um, that's expressing in your model, um, the ability to image those. And this is um, really important um, because many newer uh, research programs are looking at fluorescent protein expression as a way to say the tissue, um, the construct is expressed in the tissue of interest. Um, and then they'll ask other biological questions about how um, the um, the tumor cells may invade those, um, those um, regions of interest and then um, what is the interaction between them. So on the next slide, um, what we actually have is um, some examples of, of some work that we've done um, in the Cancer Center um, with Karen's group. This is actually um, an example of some work where we um, developed a longitudinal bioluminescent um, model um, with the, the um, pancreatic working group. Um, and this one allowed us to actually characterize not only the primary tumor expression, but also the metastatic um, lesions that develop throughout the, um, the visceral cavity. Um, this particular study was really great because not only did um, we show that you could actually do those two things, but we also demonstrated um, quantitatively that this technology can be transferred between uh, different investigators, which is the data shown to the right there both for the primary tumors and the metastatic regions. Um, and this shows the level of reproducibility that's achievable um, within this type of um, in, um, molecular environment. So the, these types of studies then can be layered on top of um, drug studies that then would allow you to start asking key questions about how your drug might modify the particular tumor growth, how it might reduce um, metastatic um, progression, um, and ultimately um, whether or not your drug is, is um, working on target as, as you anticipate. The, the next um, example is, is one that we did that was um, a little unconventional. This was a study that we did where we looked at um, a suppressor of um, cytokine signaling, the SOX1 pathway, um, in conjunction um, with an investigator um, on campus who's actually interested in uh, sepsis. Um, in this particular um, study, they were quite keen to, to image um, a MRSA type um, infection uh, that um, would become systemic. And then you could actually visualize these, these bacterial infections. And the um, 
in this particular case, the MRSA are emitting bioluminescent signal on their own. And then what we did was we, we imaged those not only in 2D um, for this investigator as shown to the right there where we have some ex vivo tissues, but we also um, imaged the three-dimensional interaction of that with the animal's host environment. Um, and we're able to show that when you treat them with um, a compound, um, this, this KIR inhibitor of SOX3, that you could actually um, prevent the, the host immune system from interacting with, um, with um, that particular um, uh, cytokine suppressor. And so therefore the, the MRSA would, would progress. And so this was a nice mechanistic study that allowed us to actually demonstrate that you can use this to, to understand key questions about the biology, and then of course the treatment um, of, the, of the particular pathway that they were interested in. Uh, the next slide actually talks a little bit about um, one of the key questions that often comes up, which is uh, sensitivity of these assays. Now, um, these are data that are provided by the, by the manufacturer. Um, and one of the things that you can see here is, is that um, in this particular example, they implanted um, up to five cells in the flank of these animals and then watched it grow through time up through 42 days. Um, one of the uh, key, key aspects of this is that by starting with such a low cell count and then watching it grow, you can actually do repeated imaging in these animals, which is important in terms of understanding your kinetics. But it also allows you to um, start at a therapeutic time point where, um, where the cells actually would be most responsive um, to a particular phase of growth and not out at the end of the study where um, the actual tumor is so large that you, you can't actually inhibit it. And this is important because um, uh, it ties back to the sensitivity of the overall system. This system has one of the best sensitivities on the market. Um, and it allows you to actually do the appropriate kinds of drug studies that would be analogous to your clinical trials where a patient presents with a tumor at an early stage, and then you're going to start treatment um, shortly after that. The, the next slide actually is um, a, uh, in a, a small example of the kinds of really complicated multiplexing that can be done in vivo um, in these model systems. Uh, what's shown on the left is a, a, a type of cell, this a 4T1 cell, um, which has a, a doubling time of about 14 hours. And if you look on the right there, there's the HeLa cells, which have a doubling time of about 34 hours. So a relatively fast growing cell versus those that are slower growing. And what they've done is they've investigated various tracers in combination in the same animal. So because these tracers have different emission um, wavelengths, we can actually co-administer them and image them at the same time, but select different wavelengths to monitor in the readout. So in the, in the top example there, we have a bombesin sense. It's a, it's a tracer that monitors um, the bombesin rece receptor. And in this particular case, they were also looking at the transferrin receptor in this particular model system. And they could overlay those and look to ask questions about um, how the tumor is responding um, and how it's growing and, and how those receptors are changing as a function of the animal's growth. There's a whole bunch of other type of receptors that are, uh, and tracers that are shown here, like the osteosense for, for, um, for marking new bone turnover. Um, we go, there we go. Uh, Sorry there about is, that. No problem. There's, um, there are IntegraSense, which is looking for um, alpha V beta three uh, markers on the endothelial cells. Uh, if you're doing um, some of the work um, where you're looking at angiogenesis, this would be a key marker for you to try and answer questions about um, vascular in, uh, infiltration. And in the lower panel there in, in both of these is MMP sense and ProSense. And so these are, um, are two different types of markers. So the MMP sense are, are, are looking at MMP activities. Um, so this would be for remodeling of the microenvironment. And then ProSense, which is actually marking a, a cathepsin cleavage. And the key thing about these lower two markers is MMP sense and the pro sense is that these are activatable probe. They're only turned on if the MMP or cathepsin markers are uh, enzymes are present. It then clips the um, molecule and makes it fluorescently visible. Otherwise, those particular tracers are, are absent from the image. So that turns out to be a, a very nice way to monitor um, that particular activity in your model system if, if you're asking questions about um, tumor remodeling and, and, um, and microenvironmental changes that would be leading to your invasion of your, of your tumor. Hey, Paul, we mm -hmm. have one question that was yeah. asking about if we're able to pick up metastatic um, lesions, say in the lung, that are GFP or M-cherry. I know you and I yeah. have had 
discussions about that, about how well the, you know, protein yeah. is expressed and yep. also the tumor burden. If you could comment on that. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so this system can detect um, lesions, um, especially metastatic lesions. The selection of the emission um, probe is very important. Um, it turns out that uh, GFP happens to overlap significantly with autofluorescence in, um, in the animal. And so it's very difficult to, um, to resolve that as, a, as the primary measure. Uh, in fact, there's about 95% overlap between GFP and autofluorescence. Um, M-Cherry is a little bit better. Um, it has about a 65% overlap with autofluorescence. Um, but it also suffers from another problem, and that is, is that the emission is, um, is, uh, happens to overlap with hemoglobin. And so if you happen to have a, a, a tissue which is rich um, in um, hemoglobin or myoglobin, either one of those, the wavelength of the emission light will be partially obscured by that um, absorption of the hemoglobin or myoglobin. And as a result, you'll actually get an attenuated signal. So it turns out to be um, those are very uh, difficult tracers to work with. Um, if you have questions about which tracers to use, um, part of the, the core's activities are to sit down with you as an investigator and help you select the appropriate um, tracer and how best to design your study so that we can get the maximum signal to noise um, and the best um, readout for your question of interest. And so if this is something that you're interested in, please um, definitely reach out to us. We that's part of the service as this core is to help you design and build your studies um, um, with the, the, the best results possible. The last little bit here is um, gonna be talking about spectral and mixing. And as I had mentioned before, um, you know, all tissues have a degree of autofluorescence associated with them. Um, and that turns out to be quite difficult um, to deal with. Um, as you can see in the left panel there, there are two mice that have two different fluorophores that are, um, that are mixed together in the same animal. And if you used a standard imaging system, that's what it would look like. However, one of the great things about <clears throat> this system is that you can um, collect fluorescent wavelengths at, um, at different um, image bands. And so in other words, you can collect a set of images that are from a specific set of wavelength bands that you're interested in, and then another set from another set of wavelength bands. And then using those as a standard, we can actually spectrally unmix your image, um, reducing not only the autofluorescence, but also be able to tell you discreetly where those are located in an animal. And that's what the, that next image in that series shows. Um, importantly is, is that um, in the far right there, you can actually see an animal that's been loaded with up to six different fluorophores simultaneously in, in a subcutaneous administration. And these happen to be um, um, fluorophores that are Q dots, I believe. But the key thing here is, is that on a normal biological readout, you would just see that as one giant signal. But importantly, in this particular case, you can not only spectrally resolve them, but we can also tell you um, what fluorophore wavelength was corresponding to what specific um, tracer at that location. And that turns out to be important if you want to do that kind of uh, multiplexing study. So um, as I said, um, you have the ability on this system to do both two-dimensional imaging, and this is for high throughput um, types of imaging where you can scan up to five mice at a time. Um, you can actually do co-localization studies if you're going in the lower left-hand corner here where we actually are doing multiplexing like we just described, uh, multiple fluorophores simultaneously administered and asking questions about here's a structure and then here's um, a cell-based system that is interacting with that structure. How do these? How are these being modified? You can also do um, co-registration um, in the lower right-hand corner here, um, which is registering the the two-dimensional and three-dimensional um, aspects of your study. So you can take and scan an animal in a two-dimensional configuration, and then at the very end, you could actually take that same animal and do a three-dimensional rendering of the of the data to ask questions about where it is and its localization within that animal. Um, and then importantly, as you can do quantification with all of these, um, this, this system um, has spent a fair amount of, uh, the engineers have spent a fair amount of time ensuring that not only bioluminescence, but fluorescence and, and um, even the CT are fully quantitatable, um, much like you would do in any other um, high quality instrument. And so as a result, we can tell you how many photons are being emitted from your bioluminescence sample, 
from your um, or fluorescent um, relative photons that are being emitted from your fluorescent sample. And I can even tell you what the density of your CT marker is if that's a, a tracer that you're using in your model system. So um, overall, um, there's a few pearls of wisdom that we'd like to share with investigators as you're starting to think about doing imaging studies. Um, and that is, is that um, we like to recommend that investigators consider running their studies according to the NC3R um, ARRIVE guidelines, which is basically randomizing your study and ensuring that you have construct and phase validity of your studies. Um, this is your model systems are very important in terms of getting accurate results. And so making sure that that construct and phase validity is, has been worked out prior to doing imaging. Blinding and a priori inclusion and exclusion criteria are super important. Um, and then, of course, estimating how many animals you're going to need per group for your power um, and considering whether or not sex has, an, has a role in terms of um, the, the rate at which your tumors uh, progress. Um, one of the things that we also like to recommend is investigators consider validating your model system. And this is something that's really important, um, determining how many cells you need and how fast they grow um, and whether or not your transgene impacts the growth rate or light production is really critical. And just assuming that your model will look just like the literature may not be true. Um, and it's important to characterize it in your system with your growth factors, with your media conditions to ensure that when you implant those tumors that they actually work the way you think they will. Um, we also think it's really important um, and recommend that investigators validate their cell, drug, and tracer dose levels to ensure that your model is working as you would expect. Um, don't assume that the literature conditions are gonna match your study setup. Um, time and time again, um, we have seen where investigators come and they say, I wanna implant a million cells. Um, and that's because they're using an older system which has lower sensitivity. Um, and they assume that their, their model system is gonna exactly match what was published. It turns out in some cases, they've, uh, I have several investigators that have used as little as 50,000 cells and got similar results um, and had to also adjust their drug treatment paradigms to, to match that cell load. And so it's important that you characterize those things up front. And then lastly, um, consider using appropriate controls. Um, you know, in these studies, when we're doing fluorescence and we're trying to do spectral and mixing, um, making sure that you have appropriate uh, controls for your, not only for your autofluorescence and for your different fluorescent markers, but also making sure that you have um, positive and negative groups within your, within your treatment paradigm to make sure that you can actually say that the responses that you're seeing are real and not some artifact of the particular measure that we're trying to make with imaging. So in the end, this is a powerful technology, it has the capability of really transforming your research. Um, and we um, are here to help do that with you. Um, so please, if you do have questions or you have, um, you know, things that you would like to know more about, our team is here to help you um, and we will sit down and, and help you design your studies and select the best markers um, for your research. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. Um, looks like it, it, um, I don't know if our slides were so complicated that it just kind of gets tired <laughs> or what. Um, but as Paul said, please reach out to any of us um, if you have questions about models and, you know, not to belabor the point, but just to emphasize again what Paul said is, you know, validating these models is really important. And the work we did with the pancreatic cancer working group, you know, they got a paper where they can, you know, reference that in their grants and show that the models are validated. And I think these, you know, types of mouse modeling approaches are not going away. Um, so consider that. We're also moving into more and more syngenaic mouse modeling. So we have models that have, you know, an intact immune system um, as well. So, you know, please reach out um, to all of us with questions. And I also just wanted to acknowledge the IU Cancer Center um, really for taking the lead on, you know, paying for preventive maintenance for the IVIS spectrum. This was a you know, kind of a large thing for them to take on. And I, we just really appreciate their support um, in that area as we continue to expand this technology on the campus. And so with that, I think we'll stop and see if there are any questions. And we also have um, core meetings and such that you can come to, be it by Zoom for now, <laughs> um, but, you know, just to have discussion about ideas and things that you're considering. <laughs>